All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I know that we're still going to probably have a few people trickling in. Um, so my name is Sky Story, and I've been running Beta and Brews for the past two years. They're normally an in-person series that happens once a month. Um, so with the stay-at-home order, it's been really great to do them once a week and kind of get our community together virtually. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple just Zoom housekeeping items first, and then I'll introduce our presenter. Um, so first off, please um, keep yourself muted for the duration of the presentation and keep your video turned off. So this slide um, should show how to mute yourself, how to turn your video on and off. That way we save bandwidth that only Carolyn will be turned on and speaking during the presentation. Um, also, if you have questions, you can ask them in the chat. Please ask them to the whole group, not to me or Carolyn privately. That way everyone can see the questions. And then I'll ask them in the Q&A to her during that portion. Uh, all right, so this again is kind of showing some more Zoom procedures. If you want to minimize your display, if you want to see anything, Carolyn won't have video going. She'll be screen sharing for this, so you don't really need to see any video right now. All right, so just a little bit about the Mountaineers, because I think we probably have some people that aren't members. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We were founded in 1906. Um, if you are a member, you know about all of the awesome activities and trips that we do. If you're not, I really recommend taking a look at the website. You definitely have already been there because you are a CP to this event. Um, and also, just with all that's happened with COVID, um, Mountaineers has taken a bit of a hit, just having to cancel some courses, canceling events. It's definitely hurt the nonprofit financially. So if you're in a place to make a gift, um, we just encourage that you do so to support the Mountaineers programs, even if that's five or ten dollars. That really does help if you've been enjoying these presentations. Um, and the link is there. I'll also put that in the chat and our post event email. Um, really quickly, I will send an email out after the event. We are recording the presentation and we'll be putting it on the Mountaineers YouTube page. So if you want to go back and see it, it'll probably be up early next week. All right, so now I'm going to hand it over to Carolyn, and Carolyn, go ahead and start your screen share. All right, screen share starting. I didn't do that quite correctly. Can I try again? Let's see. We can see it, but yeah, if you want to try it again, go ahead and. Oh, I know. I forgot to hit the advanced portion. And there we go. Oh, that's okay. There you go. That looks great. Mm -hmm. A little bit right here. Great. So I think we're ready to get going. So good, need good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Carolyn Graham, and tonight I'm going to be talking about um, the West Buttress Route on Denali. This is a climb I completed in May of 2015 as a member of a super awesome all-women self-guided team. Um, our four-person team, you had to name your team when you're on the mountain. Um, so our team name was the Jolly Girls, and I want you all to know that um, following this presentation, two of the Jolly Girls, um, Meredith Trainer and Jen Carter, are going to be joining us for Q&A. So um, there'll be three of us to answer questions. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that portion as well. Um, kind of the agenda for tonight, um, these are the things I'm going to talk about. They're all kind of related to our climb, um, research route selection, how we decided how long we were going to climb for, um, how we selected our team. Um, if you're going to climb Denali, there's a fair number of pre-climb logistics that you need to take into consideration, as well as the fitness, training, and technical skill aspect of the climb. And then finally, um, I just have some slides about what it's like to climb. And following all that, we'll have Q&A. Um, so getting started here, um, I included this slide just so um, I think when you go to do a climb you haven't done before, um, how you end up viewing the climb or 
you know, you perceive it kind of depends a lot on, on like what, you know, going into it. And so um, when I um, joined this climb in 2015, I feel like I went into the climb with my eyes pretty wide open. Um, I guess I like, I'm a pretty conservative climber and I like to be really well prepared. There's something that I kind of had under my belt um, that made me feel like this was something I knew I wanted to do. And um, I knew all the climbers I was climbing with, and I knew they were all like super bomber gals that I would climb with any day. Um, I graduated from the Mountaineers Intermediate Climbing Course in 2011, and I think following that experience, some of the things that made me kind of realize that climbing Denali was something I actually wanted to do was actually some of the time I spent abroad in Nepal and India, where I got more high altitude experience, and I spent um, longer periods of time in sub-zero temperatures, and I decided that that was something that I was okay with and could actually have a good time. Um, that's kind of what I considered to be kind of the turning point for how I decided this was something I'd actually want to do, because I'll tell you, in, you know, when I took basic in 2005, if you told me I was going to be climbing to Denali in 2015, I probably would have laughed at you and been like, no way. <laughs> so it's kind of funny how, um, your perception of things change as your experience changes. Um, the route on Denali um, is, well, 90% of the climbers are doing the West Petrus, and so there was never really a discussion on what route we're doing. Um, this is a good overview kind of of the main camps when you fly onto the mountain. Um, you fly in at um, an elevation of 7,200 on the Southeast Forest fork of the Cahiltma Glacier. And the major camps as you um, make your way up the mountain are at 7,500 feet, 9,500 feet, 11,000 feet, 14 feet at a time acclimating. And then once you get good weather, you make a summit push up to 17,200 feet at high camp. And you do your summit and you come back down. So. That's kind of um, an overview of the route. Um, and I'll probably come back to this slide at the end during Q&A because there's usually um, questions related to it. Um, so our is really important, like all the training and things we did together to get to know each other. Because, I mean, if you're going to spend a month with a group of people, um, like it's, it's really important that, you know, you all get along and you kind of understand each other because um, act and support that person is really important. Um, some of the like really important part of this climb for me is that we all came back friends um, and we really didn't give up on one another. I think all of us at some point between our training and the actual summit climb, we had a point where like we didn't think we were gonna necessarily be gonna be able to make it. And so I think that support that I felt with this team was like really important. So logistics in terms of getting ready for Denali, um, you have to climb, apply for a permit and there's a certain amount of time ahead of your climb that you have to apply, apply for it. I think it's something like 60. So our climb, um, it was going to be in May, and we applied for our um, permit in January. And we went ahead and reserved our flight onto the glacier, um, kind of in a similar time frame. Um, there's a number of small planes that fly out of Talkeetna that um, you can reserve with. But getting that reservation in early so that you're flying onto the glacier early in the morning, I think, is good because that'll allow you to move to base camp um, on your first day. So planning ahead, good idea. Um, once we arrive in Talkeetna, you're also required to have an orientation with your National Park Service Ranger. Um, so that's something to take into consideration just with your timing. Um, there's a lot of flights that go out from Seattle to Anchorage every day. Um, so getting a flight that far isn't too difficult. And once you're in Anchorage, um, you need to take like a taxi or something to get to Talkeetna. So there's like basically vans you can rent to get there. 
Um, so you don't have to rent a car or anything like that. So that's pretty nice. And that's your, your reserving your transportation to Talkeetna. And then um, this is, it wasn't such a big deal for us because we started our climb fairly early in the climbing season, but Talkeetna is a really small town. I'm talking like maybe 500 people live there year round. So having your overnight accommodation for when you arrive in Talkeetna is really important. Like you're, <laughs> unless you want to be sleeping in a tent outside, <laughs> which is an option. There's definitely um, plenty of options that way. So those are some of the pre-climb logistics um, of doing a Denali climb. Um, here we go. So <clears throat> gear, um, I think over the years, this is the thing I've gotten the most questions on. And it's kind of funny because like, if you look at the four of us in our team, like, um, you know, some of the things like a couple of us used were the same, but other things were different. And some of the things some of us loved in terms of gear were like, other people were like, oh, I don't care about that so much. So it's really kind of specific to the person. And um, it's also specific to your climb, I think. Um, our team, we we used, we benefited from a lot of experience within the Mountaineers, and we talked and basically interviewed other other teams, and were like, okay, what did you do? How did you take care of this? What did you like? What did you not like? And I think the the ultimate thing you need to keep in mind is that, like, the experience I had on Denali is not going to be the experience that you have, and it's not going to be the experience that this other team had. Um. So whether or not you say a certain piece of gear was useful or you wish you had this or didn't think you used that, um, those all come to fact into factor in like what exactly your climb looked like. Um, and so my answer is being a fairly conservative climber are probably gonna be a little different than somebody else's. And you just kind of have to take that into consideration. So this is the number that uh, really scared us. You have to weigh all your gear when you um, go to put it on your small plane that takes you to the um, fly on, flying onto the glacier from Telkitna, the Kahiltna Glacier. <laughs> and <laughs> yes, we had 600 pounds of gear, but that includes like the jacket you're wearing and the boots on your feet, which are things that you don't normally weigh, at least not when you go out in the mountains and say your pack weighs 35 pounds. Um, I don't think we were super heavy in terms of gear for the number of days we expected to be on the glacier and based on all the information we had researched. But um, based on my, our experience, basically where we ended up with, what, what we ended up with a lot more of was food. Um, so like, I don't know, my recommendation on gear is what, of what I would do differently is not bring as much food. This, it can it end up being like 2.3 pounds of food per person per day. And I, I was eating like a champ. I ate, you know, like my life depended on it. And we still had tons of food. And I would put that number down closer to two, I think, if I were to do it all over again. Um, so the little asterisk by 15 pounds of group gear. Um, that was basically gear that we all shared, and it's sort of an arbitrary thing because, for example, your personal crevasse rescue gear was not included in that number. And so, just to like make this clear, I added a slide at the very end that may or may not be part of this presentation, but it'll be in part of the slideshow that goes out, so you can look at it later if you want. Um, the amount of fuel we brought on the trip was maybe a little heavy, but within you know the recommended range. If you're gonna be on the mountain 21 days, it's usually a gallon per person per day. And we had brought food and fuel for 26 days. So the extra gallon was pretty much in line with that burn rate. I think the things to keep in mind, um, sort of lessons learned, but also, I don't know, like we didn't wanna be dependent on other teams, but you'll hear that, oh yeah, there's a lot of food and there's a lot of extra fuel on the mountain. And that's definitely true. <laughs> like, especially if you're there early season. So 
I mean, if you're not afraid to eat other people's food that they don't want, there's definitely food and fuel to be obtained. It just may not be exactly when you want to obtain it, and it may not be when you <laughs> So that was kind of an interesting part of the trip. Of the trip, um, I would say we put in like six months of really intensive, like focused physical training mixed in with the technical skills to get ready for this trip. Um, again, me being the conservative climber, I would have been like, there's too much stuff to figure out. Let's do this a year and a half from now. But um, fortunately, Meredith, who is our official um, climb leader when we had to register for the park service, um, she kept us all in line and um, basically pushed it forward so it happened that year, which I'm glad. We did that that way. Um, and anyway, so for me, in terms of physical training, um, basically my week was two strength training sessions and a weekly Tiger Mountain hike with a heavy pack. And then weekends were we would get out together for overnight trips, probably twice a month, where we worked on technical skills. And um, just got comfortable with our gear, like using the tents we're going to be sleeping in and building snow walls and all the important things that you're going to do on Denali with gear that you want to be familiar with. Um, so yeah, I mentioned here on the slide some of the things we did winter camping, building snow walls. Glacier travel with the sled is very important. Um, yeah, it's, help, it's definitely really helpful to have worked with your sled and have rigged your sled before you go to the glacier. Um, there are, um, your airline carrier, sometimes they'll off, they, like, they'll give you a sled to work with at um, base camp when you arrive on the Cahiltma Glacier, but then you have to, like, put all the rigging and stuff on it, and we didn't want to have to do that when we arrived because that would just take extra time. Um, so we used our sled, we brought our own sleds, we had them all rigged, we, you know, we knew our setup that we we're going to use so we could just sort of hit the ground running. And our sleds actually ended up being like really useful for transporting our gear. We put all of our sharks inside the sleds and clamshelled them together and duct taped them and they went on the plane um, really, really nicely that way. <laughs> so um, I was really happy with how that worked out. Um, and then the running belays, we didn't actually need to do running belays protected on the climb. We just, we didn't have conditions that required it, but there's definitely a couple spots on the climb where you may be, you may need to set protection um, on a running belay and you may have one or more sleds on your, with your team at that point in time. So, um, you know, everyone's climb is different. So we wanted to be prepared, be prepared for the knowns that were on, on the route. And then in terms of ascending fixed lines, you do this with an ascender, and that's, um, there's 800 feet of fixed lines, and I'll talk about that later on the climb. But that is a known location that everyone goes through to get to high camp. Um, and in terms of technical um, training, this is just a kind of a cool slide that shows some of the stuff we did. Um, the Mountaineers Clubhouse has a wall on the north side that's really great, the aid wall for doing <laughs> vertical crevasse rescue with a loaded sled, um, wearing gloves, hopefully. Um, one thing we figured out really fast was that, um, I don't know, if you, like you have to learn to how to send a rope um, when you're a basic student for crevasse rescue. Um, but when you're coming out of a deep crevasse, um, trying to do that, you, you eventually end up pulling your pack with you. Um, so we kind of realized like with these 50 pound packs, we're not going to be able to ascend the crevasse and be, you know, have our pack come up with us. So we came up with a system of basically um, dropping our pack and not having our pack get pulled up with us as we ascended higher on the rope. We basically had to get out of the system. And we also realized that, like, while wearing gloves, trying to push um, a Prusik or a Texas Prusik system up the rope was probably going to be pretty challenging. And so, like, I adjusted my Texas Prusiks and my 
um, harness um, prusik to be a length that I could use my ascender to grip the rope with so that I didn't have to try to loosen that prusik knot as I was going up an eight dot something something millimeter rope. And um, right, and oh, and so again, being a somewhat conservative climber, I also carried a mini traction, a pestle mini traction pulley. So my um, personal crevasse rescue system included on um, one of my text prusiks and on, on my waist prusik, um, it was the mini traction pulley with the carabiner through that, so I had a, a handhold. Um, so on the mountain, we kind of had a strategy to basically take advantage of everything we could. Uh, could. Um, like we're just, I feel like we we're just, you know, average people coming onto the mountain, so we weren't going to try to do anything non-standard. So um, basically, we had heavy loads, and we realized like some people do single carries beyond Camp One at 7800, and we're like, no, we're not doing that. So we basically followed the the normal protocol where you, um, because the 7800 camp is pretty flat, it's like five and a half miles. Like you drop down a little bit and then you ascend a total of 1,200 feet um, that day. We knew we were going to single carry that, but after that we were going to cache gear and kind of leapfrog our way up the mountain. There are some alternative camps um, on the mountain that we decided we weren't going to use just because they're, um, I mean, it takes a lot of effort to build snow walls and everything. And a lot of times they're not in a location where you have very good weather, so you would only use them if you're like single carrying up and the weather is great or something. So we kind of knew we weren't going to do that. We were just going to stick with the standard move to Camp One at 7,800, move to you know the 9,200 foot camp, move to the 11,000 foot camp, move to the 14,000 foot camp. Um, and so between each of these moves um, above 7,800, we are caching food and fuel before each move. And you always have to keep like four days of food with you. So you like you move all your food, but then you keep like four days because you may not be able to move camp exactly when you think you may have to be waiting out a storm and that sort of thing. And so on the days that we plan to move, those are the days where you actually have the really heavy loads. So like we tried to like do as much prep work as we could the night before, like we'd melt water and you know, we cut out a little cupboard in the snow and keep it keep it insulated so it didn't you know freeze up overnight. So we kind of had water kind of ready to go in the morning. Those kinds of things. Um, one of the things I really like about um, the West Buttress route on Denali is that it lends itself to proper acclimatization when you're just doing the route the way you do it. Um, so like if you just work your way up the route, as I had discussed. Um, it basically puts you at the 14,000 foot camp no earlier than night eight. And one of the other acclimatization things is um, that you spend at least five nights at 14,000 foot camp before you move up to 17. Um, once getting up to 17 is pretty commi committing. You have to have good weather and you definitely don't want to get stuck up at 17 in a storm because basically most people who get most people who are weighed out a storm at 17 have used up all their food and fuel reserves and are basically out of energy because you don't get any sleep um, to make a summit push. So waiting for that good weather window is really important. On our particular climb, we actually spent nine days at the 14,000 foot camp before we moved up to 17. So that gave me a lot of confidence that we were actually really well acclimated. So now I'm going to get into the part of what it's actually like to climb um, to climb Denali. Um, <laughs> your flight onto the Kahiltna Glacier is really amazing. Like, um, I actually had family members that um, had visited Alaska after I did this climb, and I was like, oh my gosh, if you're going to be in Talkeetna, just go on the scenic flight. I mean, it costs you a bundle, but it is like, it's just super, super amazing. And so what you're seeing out the window of the airplane is right here. <laughs> and you look at the mountains, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going where? <laughs> but, you know, you have a month to climb it, so um, all in good time. 
So um, usually when you land, the weather is awesome and it's like 40 degrees and baking out and you're immediately taking off as much clothing as you can. So I think we probably had just gotten off the plane because we all still have a f- more clothing on than I feel like I walked out of base camp with. I was wearing as little as possible when we <laughs> got out of base camp. Um, um, but basically your your gear is all packed in the airplane and it like comes out in this kind of big mess and you have to like reorganize it and pack your sled. Um, usually it's a good idea to leave like a few days of food at base camp. You have to dig a really super deep trench. I remember getting into it and it was like over my head. Like if I've ever felt like I was being buried in snow, that was about the time. But it has to be super deep because like in the months that you're gone, like a ton of snow melts at base camp. And the park service gives you these really long wands to mark your your team name on it and everything so you can find it again when you're done. But basically, um, yeah, we're loading up our sleds, getting ready to go. Um, Clean little barrel things are called clean mountain cans. And so that's how waste disposal is taken care of on the mountain. Um, And they decided that we needed two of them. Um, I think we ditched one of them at 11,000 feet, 11,000 feet, because we decided we could um, get by with one above that location. But yeah, they're aligned with um, these biodegradable bags, and there are certain spots where you um, drop off your waste in crevasses that are marked on the route. So yeah, that's how you um, keep the mountain clean on Denali. Oh, and the park service um, actually like won't let you go up to high camp if you don't have a clean mountain can. Like that's like one of the things they monitor for. So um, I was really happy to see that because the 17,000 foot camp is really where waste disposal is the hardest because there are no crevasses nearby. So um, yeah, that's that part of the trip or part of the climb. Um, if you've never seen what it's like to be inside a cook shelter, um, this is the Mega Med. Um, and we would spend four to six hours a day melting water, probably closer to six. And I'm not joking when I say that it takes that much time. Um, you think, oh yeah, I can melt water faster than that. Well, the air gets thinner as you go higher. And it's really nice to be um, in a shelter. Like most people who are climbing Denali have some kind of shelter. Um, when you're on a larger team, you might even have a dedicated tent. Um, but when it's snowing out, like getting outside cooking water is like awful. <laughs> and I don't know, like the cool part about with the Mega Mid is basically it's a floorless tent with the center pole is that you can cut out, you can see how um, Meredith's sitting here. So you basically cut out seats and you just bring your your foam pad in here and you can sit down and you actually have back support and you cut out so you have a table. And basically it's like a table and you put your stove. Um, And yeah, so that actually made like, you know, outdoor cooking and making water to be pretty comfortable. And it was off and above freezing inside. Um, So I I don't know, when I first heard like people saying like, oh, you should bring a cook tent. I was like, what? Why would we bring all that? But something I definitely um, was really glad to have on the trip. So um, this is the 11,000 foot camp. And this is typically where you um, leave your snowshoes behind and switch to crampons. Um, I don't know if these people are leaving their snowshoes permanently like that. We, we buried all of ours um, in our cache along with um, some food from the way down and probably some extra food that we realized we weren't gonna eat at that point in time as well. And I think I actually left I had some lightweight long underwear that I left at that point because I was like, oh, I'm not going to use this higher up. I'm just going to be in that. Um, so, yeah, 11,000 is where you um, switch over to crampons, typically. And the mountains you see in the background are um, Foraker and Hunter. And you see those mountains, like, a lot going up when the weather is good. Um, so, yeah, just super beautiful. All the pictures are going to be sunny and beautiful because when it's not sunny and beautiful, it's not worth worth taking a picture. Um, and a lot of times getting up to 11,000 feet, going over Cahiltna Pass, the weather is kind of not good, but 
the route is usually pretty well wanded, so you can kind of move up when the weather is a little more marginal. But above 11,000 foot feet, 11,000 feet, you have to get around Windy Corner, which, given the name Windy, is it's you know probably going to be windy, and you want pretty good weather to go around that. And so this is kind of a cool picture because you can kind of see how, like when you're pulling a sled, it's actually like your body is leaning into it. <laughs> <laughs> so it is, it is a fair amount of work, especially when you have a steeper slope. Um, like getting up to 14 out of the slopes are super steep. They'd probably be like green runs at a, at a ski area. But like when you have that weight pulling down on you and like you don't have any place to stop for like maybe three hours at a time, it, it's definitely a lot of work. I wasn't really expecting to be... I wasn't really expecting to have to be carrying my pack for three hours at a time, but there are definitely places you know, getting up to 14 where um, there just wasn't a good place to stop. So you, you end up being on the move for three hours. <laughs> and that's just the way it was. But I guess everything's kind of in slow motion because you're just in high altitude. So you just kind of deal with it. Um, when you see people carrying their sleds, it's because they're coming back from um, having cached um, their food. And so um, their sled's empty, so it's just easier to carry it on your back. But it looks kind of cool, like, yes, sled's on your back. <laughs> the bright orange. Ah, and here's the infamous windy corner. It was definitely windy the first couple times we went around it. You're going to pass windy corner um, more than one time on the way up because you're, you're setting a cache. We set a cache on the other side of it. And it's kind of funny because, like, on our way down, it was actually like not windy at all. It was like really nice. You're kind of like baking in the sun. But like, this is where you kind of start to see the, um, the it, like this is all blue right here and it's really hard. And then you're like, oh yeah, that's why I'm carrying an ice screw as part of my crevasse rescue kit. Um, and also like <laughs> the sleds, like when it's really hard ice like that, they don't track behind you. So you're dealing with this sled that's like actually pulling you sideways when you're on any kind of side slope. So this is where like having a sled really starts to be like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like having some experience on different kinds of terrain with your sled um, definitely pays dividends when you get into this kind of terrain. And so the other part of our strategy um, for climbing the mountain was that we only brought two sleds um, above Windy Corn, above um, the 11,000 foot camp. So basically the front person had the sled and then the back person didn't have a sled. And that way, like the two people between them were able to like better control it. Um, and I was really glad we did that because, um, I don't know. <laughs> there can be some crevasses on the other side of Windy Corner and I don't know, deal, having to deal with two sleds is just more complicated than necessary. So once we moved up to 11,000 feet, um, we had to pick up our cash, and I think we got a rest day finally. Um, <laughs> I think we were pretty tired by the time we got up to 11,000 or up to 14,000 feet. But um, you know, when you have great weather and great views like this, it makes it a lot more fun. Um, basically, like the 14,000 foot camp is like a little city. And this is kind of where you finally have time to um, really start to get to know the other teams on the mountain. And it was, it was like, really fun. Um, like, you meet people from different countries. Um, I think as, as a self-guided team, you end up talking to more independent climbers than you do guided teams, which is it was a little interesting. Um, but it's a really neat experience. It's definitely nothing like climbing in the Northwest where you know, <laughs> like you're off in this remote area and you don't see anyone for a week. Um, climbing Denali, you have people, there's other people on the route all the time, but, and you know, you have other people at base camp and they're all like really supportive. It's, it's, it's really nice. Like when you walk into camp and like people greet, you're like, Hey, welcome to camp. You know, you're welcome to use our, um, our toilet shelter while you get yours built. I mean, it was it was really great to see how supportive other teams were on the mountain. Um, it's just like really, really different climbing than, than in the Pacific Northwest. Um, 
So getting to um, one of the technical cruxes, the climb, this is, uh, there's a head wall um, above the 14,000 foot camp. Um, it's 800 feet of fixed lines on, I'm gonna call it alpine ice. I don't know, Mountain Project seems to say it's like 55 degrees, I would call it 40. Um, so the fixed lines probably start, I don't know, maybe around this point here, if you can see my, my pointer. But basically you send about 1200 feet and um, then you go up the fixed lines, you have to stay on the right and you're using an ascender um, as protection. And um, one thing to know going up the fixed lines, you definitely wanna like reduce your spacing, spacing on your glacier rope to be closer together. You don't wanna be like 20 meters apart because that's just way too, way too, close, way too far apart. But yeah, um, if you've done any alpine ice, it'll be, the fixed lines will be like a piece of cake, but it's definitely um, hard blue glacier ice. <laughs> um, but yeah, steel crampons on Denali for sure. So um, once we, um, um, so our summit strategy involves caching, placing a cache of food at 16,200 feet at the top of the fixed lines which is what a lot of people do. Um, basically, while you're hanging out at 14,000 feet waiting for your weather window, um, it's not uncommon to just, you know, like even if you only have half of a day, like you take a hike up 1,200 feet, come down. Um, it's good just to like get a little exercise each day and um, maybe take an extra lap up the six lines, depending on how much time you have. Um, but yeah, this is a cool picture because you can see a camp down below. And then the ranger tents are over here. And, um, so like the ranger tents have the weather posted every morning or in the morning. So you go over there and you can read the weather forecast if you didn't get it on the radio the night before. Um, the rangers are out, they come through the camp sometimes. Um, when we had gotten up to 14, basically nobody had summited the mountain all season because it had been just really bad weather. And some teams were actually starting to head down because, um, you know, their amount of time on the mountain was up. And the rangers hadn't moved up to 17 or anything yet. Um, but all the rangers are really nice. You know, they'll talk to you and you can ask them questions. They're really good, good resources of information. Um, next slide. This is another view of the fixed lines looking downward. Um, and you can, I guess what I wanted to point out is like most people like actually face outward going down. So that's why I say, I think it's probably more like 40 degrees, at least when we were there in terms of the slope of the ice. Now for the part of the climb that I actually like the best, above 16,200 feet and getting up to the 17.2 camp, um, you follow this ridge that's just really beautiful. Um, there's a lot of places where it's like, there's a lot of exposure. I mean, it's class three. So you're kind of going over some rocks. There's like a bit of a fixed line right below Washburn's thumb here. But the rest of it, there is like places where you can clip into pro. Sometimes you have to provide your own carabiners. So we had, you know, like a dozen or so carabiners that we brought for that purpose. Um, and we rearranged our ropes so that we had 20 meter spacing. We had two 40 meter ropes. So one person on the end coiled 20 meters. Um, one of the people in the middle tied into both ends of the rope. And we had, basically we were maximizing our spacing so that we always had at least one piece of protection clipped in among our team. And this is just another picture of that beautiful ridge um, getting up to high camp. And you can see a 14,000 foot camp below, like, and there's just like really huge exposure here. I wouldn't call it knife edge, but like, like, like you wanna trip over your bootlaces or anything, cause it could be really bad. Like people have, you know, drop packs or falling down, down, <laughs> down onto the glacier, like on the other side here, and it's not, like, that's really bad. <laughs> like, you do not want to end up down there. Like, you may not. And then this is high camp. So um, we moved up to high camp 
on what I would consider the first legitimate four-day weather window of the season. Um, there were some teams, about 20 people, that summited earlier than us in the season on a, basically it was a weak low pressure system on a three-day window. And those teams were coming down in like some pretty high winds on the ridge and like, you know, none of the climbing ranges had gone up through that. So um, basically we were on the mountain long enough to get the first legitimate weather window. And it was gave us just enough time to actually summit and, and get back down and, you know, get back to our jobs and everything. So the 17,000 foot high camp is actually not as beautiful as the other camp. It's, I mean, it's really high also, and everything's just hard and the snow is rock hard and it just takes a lot of effort to do everything. Um, but um, I guess what's shown in this picture is, um, when you go to do your summit bid, you're um, you're heading up to Denali Pass, which is shown here. And it's kind of funny because like, getting up to Denali Pass is like only a thousand feet, but when you're that high on the mountain, it takes you so much longer <laughs> to get up a thousand feet just to that next that next part of the route. Um, yeah. So when we moved up, we had um, a four-day weather window, and I think we brought four days. We had four days of food cached. Maybe it was five. I think it was five days of food that we brought up with us and five days of fuel. Um, and it took us three days. Um, so one day we moved up. The second day, um, not all teams take a rest day. Um, so I'm sorry. Our summit, our summit was four days. So one day to move up. Um, so your four days of good weather is one day to move up and get your tent set up. Your second your second day, you can back carry. We picked up our cash along the way. So we just used that day to rest and to build snow walls. And like one of the books I had read about Denali was basically said that if you're strong enough to get up to high camp, you're strong enough to summit. So I don't know. I use that as, you know, kind of a, a ruler. Like, you know, did we feel okay getting up to seven? Okay. so. You know, if we feel okay on summit day, then we're all going to the summit. And so that's kind of what ended up happening is, you know, we had our day to rest and build the snow walls and get everything ready. And so then on the third day, um, we went up to the summit and came back. And then on the fourth day, we moved back down the mountain. And so I don't have a lot of pictures higher up on the mountain because my camera stopped right here working because it was like frozen. <laughs> but this is above Denali Pass, the Zebra Rocks. Um, so Denali Pass has um, fixed protection that the Park Service maintains. Um, the fixed lines are maintained by the Guide Service. So going up Denali Pass, um, it, it was pretty steep, hard snow, but there was kind of a track, um, I guess, kicked in. So like kind of like on Rainier, like when you have a track kicked in, it's not as difficult to navigate. But we definitely clipped into all the protection, again, on the 20-meter spacing um, because, you know, there's, there's not a lot of forgiveness on how hard the snow was and the angle of the snow and everything. Um, and so a couple, there's a couple of places on the way up the mountain also that have um, some pickets to clip. And you can kind of see here where there's um, some fixed gear. And we just, we just clipped everything that was there. Um, so on some, you, you, there's usually not an alpine start for Denali because really you could climb it at any time of day because it never gets dark, <laughs> which is another kind of weird aspect of the climb. Um, like when you look at gear lists, like, home, and I, I know being from the Northwest where I climb, it's like, what? Like, that's like one of the 10 essentials. You can't not have a headlamp. <laughs> So I think, I know I brought a headlamp, but I definitely didn't need it. I thought maybe I'd need it in a snowstorm or something, <laughs> but I never needed it. Um, anyway, so you don't start, you don't need to start super early in the morning because Denali Pass is actually in the shade. So getting up earlier is not necessarily beneficial. Um, our summit day, um, it took us 15 hours, 10 hours to get up to the summit and five hours to get down. Usually you come down and half the amount of time you go up. So we kind of hit that right on, <laughs> right on the nose in terms of like how much time it would take us. Um, Meredith 
had a couple of shots from the summit. Um, I guess her camera was in a more insulated pocket. So like on summit day, like definitely like over boots, puffy pants the whole day. Um, I don't think I had my parka going up Denali Pass, but like definitely on the summit ridge once we got to the top of Pig Hill. Um, it was like a little bit sheltered there, but you could tell it was gonna get super windy on that ridge. Um, like one of the other teams was coming back and they're like, yeah, it's blowing like a constant 40, but it's constant, so it's okay. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, our summer hang out there. Um, when we got lower down on the football field, it was like actually pretty low wind there. So we were able to like, take a break there and um, enjoy the views from there. Um, what else do I have to say about summit day? Oh yeah, <laughs> like really, this is where like um, loss of appetite really kicks in. I think is above seventeen. I mean, I'd read okay, yeah, you bring as you want to eat like sugar. Um, I think I drank maybe a liter and a half of water all day. I kept my my water. Um, in my backpack so that it wouldn't freeze and put a lot of sugary drink in it so that it wouldn't freeze. I know somebody's water bottle froze solid and I don't think we got that thing unfrozen until like we were back down on, I don't know, like camp two at 7,800 7, feet or something like that. Um, so yeah, not letting your water bottle freeze is uh, it's easier said than done, I'd say. But in terms of what I ate on summit day, I had like all this special food for high camp and um I didn't eat as much as I thought I would. Um I think I maybe was able to eat two bars and it was mostly like candy type sugary stuff. I remember at one point I was downing these like espresso goos and I was like, I don't know, someone was asking me like, how do you feel? And I'm like, I need some energy. And even the espresso goo just didn't feel like the energy I was used to. But um we all made it to the summit and we all made it down and no one got frostbite, um, no cold fingers, toes or any of that. So I'm really happy. That was kind of really important to me. Um, I think it also helped that the year we were there, it was probably warmer than it normally would have been in May. So there's a little luck in terms of like whether you actually can summit on Denali is like, because you have to have the right weather. And I forgot to talk about this, forgot to talk about this in a little bit in the beginning, but um, we kind of decided on taking four weeks off of work to give us um, the most number of days on the mountain. And so we actually ended up being on the mountain for 25 days, um, using all our days plus an extra half a day. <laughs> um, and I have another slide here that just kind of summarizes some of the things that all have to kind of line up for you to have a successful summit. And, you know, having the right weather, I think there's definitely a luck element. Like some years are just better than others. Like you could do all the things right. And if you're not on the mountain during the time when there's a good weather window, um, it just might not happen. Um, so these numbers are numbers that, um, in terms of like training and how much I spent, and those are numbers I crunched for myself. Um, and obviously, depending on what gear you own and um, what you're able to borrow, you're going to come up with a different number. Our team was able to secure some discounts on pro discounts on gear, on gear just from people we knew and from using the Mountaineers. Like I think it was like. It was experticity or promotive, I can't remember which it was, back in 2015. Um, and then just borrowing gear as well. And we tried to just to maximize all our options in those that respect. Um, yeah, that kind of is a summary of what it takes here. Um, people like to ask about sleds and gear here, and I just pointed out some different things. Um, when it comes to sleds, there's like more than one right way to do it. Um, I think the website Alpine Ascent International, their outfit has a good, a really good article on different things you can do with your sled. Um, 
but yeah, there's only one right answer for a lot of these things. And depending on who you, who, who, depending on who you talk to, you're gonna get you're gonna get different answers. Um, so yeah, this is just kind of a summary of all the things you have to do with your 25 days. Um, and really, a lot of it is you need the time for acclimatization, and then you need the time to move between camps. And when you're moving between camps, you're really moving through weather systems. You're kind of like to climb in Alaska, you have to be a patient climber is what I've read a lot. And so when you're moving up on Denali, you're like you're moving when the weather allows. And so like you're not you usually don't get like five, you know, five or six or seven consecutive days of good weather for you to be able to move up really fast. Um, so that's what kind of takes up a fair amount of your time on Denali. Um, and also moving is, I don't know, moving all that gear up is just really exhausting. So like, I don't know, when, when we had a, when we had a weather day, it was actually kind of a welcome rest day. <laughs> so it wasn't, I don't know. I, I never felt like I was spending a lot of time stuck in a tent, not having anything to do. Um, when we came down from the summit, we were hit by a storm and we were able to descend as And to be honest, like all of us were just super exhausted um, from being that high. And I never thought I could sleep so much. Like, I think we ate at most twice a day. <laughs> and we would just like, you know, you know, shovel out the tent every once in a while. But I, I never felt like I was um, stuck in a tent for like a period of time longer than you know, I really ever needed or was, I was never, you know, I was never feeling like I was lacking in, in things to do because I was stuck in a storm. And so this um, slide I have here is just sort of a summary of what our trip looks like and, you know, how we made our way up the mountain. Um, and so the green days here are the days that we used for our summit push. So you know, we waited again for that, you know, four days of good weather. And you can see here all the days that we were at 14,000 feet waiting for the right weather, but at the same time becoming very well acclimated. And then here's the storm we waited out at 7,800. 7, so, um, and I'm guessing I'm going to conclude with just um, if you're interested in climbing Denali, there's a lot of good books out there that'll give you some perspective on what it's like. So I've just included included those. Um, the National Park Service, I think, is really has very comprehensive information. Um, so definitely don't overlook that. Um, and then there's a lot of different, a lot of people have written trip reports and have, like there's a lot of just personal accounts on the, on the internet now too. I think this um, this Colby Coons book, it's a, um, published by the Mountaineers, it's not always wet, but West Buttress, is probably like if you're looking for like a climbing guide of what it's like, um, that's probably the go-to one that like if you're climbing the route, most people are probably referencing that. It has really great aerial photos um, taken by Bradford Washburn, who um, pioneered this route. Um, yeah. That's about all I have. Um, I think I'll end on this slide. Um, our team, um, we were recipients of the Live Your Dream grant that we applied for through the American Alpine Club. Um, so if you're planning to do an expedition, I would definitely encourage you to apply for that. Um, it takes a little, it's not a huge application or anything, but I don't know, it's just something kind of cool. Give you a little money to go up in. Yeah. So I can take questions at this time, Sky. Awesome, yeah, so if you guys have questions that weren't answered already, I know Jen and Meredith were doing a great job of answering some as they came up, um, but feel free to put them in the chat and then I'll read them out and Carolyn will answer. I think Meredith and Jen can answer too. <laughs> Yay, Meredith's on. No, we had. <laughs> Yeah, my hat on too. <laughs> yeah. 
I've got mine on too. <laughs> Mine's blue. Leanne texted she's wearing hers, but she's out climbing. <sighs> nice. I'm jealous. <laughs> All right, looks like we have one question coming in. Um, what was the best meals to cook eat? Depends on who you ask, right? <laughs> <laughs> we all had such different dietary um, restrictions. So I don't know if Meredith, you want to talk about that, but we had vegetarian, we had someone that um, was lactose intolerant, we had someone that was on a low salt diet. So we had lots of different options. Um, and a lot of them were sort of like, you had your rice base and you could put this on it or you could put that on it. And, and so we all had different powdered proteins to put on our dehydrated proteins to put on our foods so that we would have different kinds of proteins. Um, my favorite was the dehydrated um, sweet potato curry, coconut curry that Leanne made at home in her own dehydrator <laughs> and we took it with us. That was my favorite. I don't know, Meredith, what was your favorite? <laughs> uh, that sweet potato curry is like crack. I actually just put the same like dehydrated coconut milk into a bag for a trip I'm doing this weekend. It's so good. We've had it on every climb every year since. And every time Leanne's like, what should I bring? I'm like, bring the coconut curry and wine. Um, but I think, I think actually, another yeah, go ahead, Carolyn. Oh, I was going to say, another way to ask that question is, uh, or to answer the question is, like, I would say it depends on what altitude I'm at, um, because sometimes you just want, like, a really easy meal that doesn't take any time to cook. The mashed potatoes were actually a really big hit when we were, like, when we were kind of, like, just, we need to eat now. We don't want to spend a lot of time. So we kind of saved those for the days, like, when we moved camp, and, you know, you just put mashed potatoes, butter, and throw some dehydrated vegetables in there. And that made a really great meal. And it was just super easy. Yeah, I was going to say a, a good takeaway from our climb with all of our different diets was that we basically each picked like a base. And it was mostly, I think, rice. Um, and then we made sure we had a protein. And so for me, as a, I can't remember if I was a pescatarian or vegetarian when we climbed, but mine was beef TVP, like a dehydrated beef product. And I still use it. It's Thrive is the product. Um, and I just packed it today, again, for a trip this weekend. Um, and being able to kind of like each have the same meal, but in our own way really helped us, I think, each get the food we needed and feel healthy on the climb. That's awesome. Those all sound really good. Um, all right, another question is, was there anything that you would have done differently, either in preparation or on the climb itself? I would have the food. <laughs> I already said that, though. <laughs> you cut out a little, Carolyn. What did you say? Oh, I was going to say, I would have brought, like, less food. But I already kind of mentioned that. <laughs> Less food, food, more fuel. <laughs> yeah. For me, I think it would be less food for sure. Um, I put this in the comments, but I really felt like at 14 camp, I was like a street hawker being like, take my mango, take my pretzels. Please don't make me carry this shit down the mountain. I already carried it up the mountain. Like, please, please take my mangoes. Um, we had a we had a sled full of food that Meredith managed to give away so that we didn't have to carry a sled full of food back down the mountain. <laughs> I like aggressively walked it. I walked around with like layers of food being like, buy my food. It's in my coat. Come buy it or just take it. Um, but I think the other thing actually is um, we didn't get a summit photo because of the weather and because of the situation with cameras and as a cold body person, I was wearing all of my gear, as you saw in that really awful summit selfie I took. And I had my big gloves on and I wasn't willing to take them off because I was genuinely cold. I wasn't too cold in my coat, but I was cold enough that I didn't want to take them off. And it really bums me out that we didn't get a summit selfie because it's not very common that an entire climbing team summits together. It's actually really rare for a 100% summit rate. And we really did that as a team and I'm very proud of it. And I would have loved to get a photo of all four of us girls together. That said, the reason we didn't stop to fix my camera, I had like rolled the dial to a different setting, which is why you got that overexposed photo of Leanne's butt. But, uh, you know, we, 
we were making the the right decision. It was cold. It was blowing. We were chilling down rapidly because we had just walked up for like, you know, days and days and it was time to go down. So it was the right decision. But afterwards, if there was a thing I could do differently, that's probably like number one for me is like either get get the photo, not for the bragging rights, but for the memories. Um, or just like take a little more time to be up there because you're only going to go up that high on that mountain probably one time maybe you repeat mountains but i i don't so um all right i don't know if any of you have done anything in nepal but someone is asking a question about how hiking three passes in nepal with heavy packs compares to the fitness you would need for Janali. That's kind of what um, Carolyn. So I I haven't done all three three of the passes, but I've done one of them. Um, I was just tea house trekking, so I wasn't carrying a super heavy pack. Um, I'd say it's definitely good preparation being high. Um, when I had been to Nepal in two thousand nine, I'd been over Shirpani Kul and West Kul, so I'd actually been to like. Um, just below 20,000 feet, and that was carrying probably like 35 or 40 pounds. Um, so you definitely get a feeling for how slow you move. Like, I don't know, I just remember feeling like, oh, I have this heavy pack on, but oh, you know, I don't really move any faster with the not heavy pack. Um, so I think, you know, I don't think it's like necessary experience to have necessarily been that high, but I think it's beneficial to kind of know how your body reacts just because, I don't know, <laughs> you're not scared by it as much. All right, um, and on the climb, did you guys experience any crevasse falls or any punch throughs? And if so, was all of your pre-planning and training sufficient or were there anything else you'd recommend? Anybody else want to answer? Yeah, I don't think we had Jen? any any crevasse punch throughs or anything. I mean, we saw a big hole where obviously someone else had fallen through and been rescued, but we were like days behind that. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we didn't have any travel. That's good. Yeah, and I'm I think glad. I think a factor for that was the time of year that we climbed. I think Carolyn mentioned early in the presentation that we went kind of early in the season, and I've planned Alaska range climbs since then, which have not worked out. Uh, and I think a takeaway is with climate change, the season is moving earlier and earlier. And so, you know, the earlier you get in there, the more snow there is on, on all the snow bridges, the, the more consolidated things are. So you're, you're going to have fewer um, punch throughs. I don't remember seeing that many on the way out, but we walked out in pretty inclement weather and I honestly had eyes on the prize. I was like, I mean, French fries this weekend, it's happening. So it wasn't, you know, we weren't like, I was safe, <laughs> but I was not really like, I wasn't touristing at that point. I had a place to go. And I will add that like crevasse danger is like everywhere. Like you go to set up camp and you're probing um, just, to know what's underneath you like it's not something you can take for granted just because you don't see over open crevasses the crevasses in alaska are way bigger than the crevasses here I think one, of the, so. one of the scariest things is dropping off your poop bags into the crevasse they have designated for the poop so you seriously have someone like belay you to the edge of the crevasse and you drop your poop bag in it's so scary it's terrifying <laughs> So Jen, one of the things I was thinking about the other day is like when we were coming down to the 11,000 foot camp, things were starting to get pretty melted out there. And I remember like, <laughs> I think we were just using someone else's pee hole. <laughs> and she came back, she's like, my gosh, I needed to go on belay practically to go pee because it, it just melts out so much. <laughs> so gross. <laughs> <laughs> Not for the anyway, it, yeah, it, things are definitely getting melted out as you get to the end of May and into early June. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, did you bring solar panels to charge your phones or cameras? And if so, did they work well? Yeah, the solar panel that we had worked really well. Um, Mike, as long as it wasn't snowing. As long as it wasn't snowing. As long as there was <laughs> solar to be had. 
<laughs> my camera froze up, so I, I the cold just zapped the battery, and I couldn't really use my camera. So, but I have a cheap ass old camera, so maybe buy a better camera. I don't know. <laughs> I think that's a good thing to know about, like from Leanne's perspective, if she were here. You know, she's someone who listens to music to decompress and it's kind of she's more of an introvert than like I am for example and so as some as an introvert she found it you know helpful to listen to music but as a result that solar panel was very important to her because her iPod was tied to you know that solar panel doing its thing um you know all each of us had different strategies like Jen just pointed out like I bought a new camera for the trip and then I mostly kept it off unless I was taking a photo and kept it like super buried to keep it warm enough. But as a result, I have fewer photos and they're not that great of photos. So, you know, like that awesome summit shot. One thing I would have done differently is I would have, I would have used one of those sunny days or partly sunny days we had at 14,000 feet and like fully charged my Kindle because I think after we had been snow and I don't know. I think after, I mean, I think the cold, st storing them in the cold um, kind of drained the battery because I do kind of wish my Kindle battery wasn't dead when we were at 7,800 camp for three nights. <laughs> and I think that was a function of just not really like paying attention because I hadn't really been using it through the trip. And if I'd paid attention and noticed the battery had um, gone down, I probably would have charged it before we went up to high camp. <laughs> All right, um, this is a good one. Do you find Rainier as good training grounds for Denali? And if so, any particular routes? Yes. I would say yes. yes. <laughs> any route? <laughs> Take your sled? <laughs> Although I would say, I think Baker is better. Because mm. Baker is, you know, I love Baker, but Baker is like such a big, snowy, deep snow mountain with lots of like good spots to practice digging in a camp. We went to Baker, I, we did like one big trip a month, I think it was, to practice our snow skills. And I think we went to Baker twice. You guys went to Rainier once without me. And then there was another Rainier trip, I think, is like about how it shaped up. Yeah. Is that right? I like, I, mean, I thought Baker was a good spot to practice all those skills. Definitely practice dragging a sled downhill and then you will just like live in the suck and understand that it is not a thing you're going to mitigate and you should just embrace the suck. <laughs> type two fun, sleds downhill. Or side hilling with the sled. That's also really fun. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> There are sled brakes. I, I forgot to mention that. You wrap cord around your sled so that it doesn't whack you quite as hard on the way down. <laughs> um, all right, this is a good one. What were your high points and low points from the climb? Hmm. I think my high point, I agree with Carolyn when she said that the ridge line above 14 camp above the fixed lines is like the most amazing place in the world. <laughs> and I go back to that place in my brain all the time. I love that place. Um, I think the low point for me was when the storm came in and we were trying to fly off the glacier because we had already finished the climb. We had to go to work and we were just stuck waiting for it to clear so we could get an airplane. That was, that was the biggest downer. Very anticlimactic. <laughs> what about you guys? I'll go next. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, Carolyn, trying to make sure I don't speak over you on the phone call. Um, for me, the, so I, in terms of like section of the climb, for sure, the 16 to 17 section, so fun and interesting. I was really scared and worried about it before I got there. I talked to a lot of, or several climbers had already done it and they made it seem really hard. And when I got there, it wasn't hard. It was this like breezy joy of Alpine mountain adventure. It was so satisfying. It was, and it was just beautiful. It dropped off on both sides. We were like, you know, pulling like a total Jim Nelson, looping the rope around the rocks as we all walked forward and it was a blast. Um, but I will say, 
when I look back at the experience overall, I'm going to like get all emotional or something. Uh, when I look back at the experience overall, what actually is most, uh, was the most satisfying part of the climb was the training. And it's funny to say that, but we just, we really intentionally built a team and we worked together toward a common goal. And then we went and we crushed it. And, you know, the, the summit sort of felt like the cherry on top um, and getting down safely, definitely that too. Uh, but the experience of doing this with a group of women uh, no, and then finding out when we got there that we were the only all women's group on the mountain that year. And then finding out when we got there that everyone was reading our blog. So we were getting to camps and people were like, oh my God, are you the Denali girls? And we were like, oh, what? Who are you? Like, we feel famous, you know? And it was just that we had written this blog about our process and everyone else in the same process was reading it. Um, I was really proud of the intentional effort and the plans that we made and the way we executed them and then just crushed our experience. That was my finest part. Probably the most tough part for me, uh, Carolyn and I had like a difficult communication on the way down to like 11 camp. We were, we had a sled between us. We were tired. We were hungry. We ended up hollering at each other and expressing some feelings. And I love Carolyn. And it just was, you know, it was one of those things, you know, it was like, we were tired and we had busted our asses and nobody was showing up to give us a beer, you know? And so like, it's tough when you have those moments, but a good climbing team, you got to communicate through it and you got to do the work and like love on each other and be like, I know you're tired. I know I'm tired. I'm not going to like make this the story of, of our friendship, you know? And so that was, that was challenging, but here we are. And she's giving the presentation. I get to join from Alaska. <laughs> Thanks gals. Okay. So I'm going to answer this all kind of a little bit differently from either of you because, um, I think I felt, to me, the summit wasn't the summit until we were down safely, and I felt like once we got to 14,000 feet, we were, like, in a safe spot, so it was, like, finally when we were down to 14, that 14,000 feet that I was, I was, like, it kind of all sank in, so for me, that was, like, okay, we made it to the summit, we made it back, and we actually did all these things without any, like, mishaps, so for me, I think, like, the summit was actually the, the getting getting down part as well. And then in terms of like low points, um, there that I was gonna be able to make it. Um, like when we, you know, got to 7,800 foot camp, like I woke up in the morning and like my back was all tweaked and everything. And you guys were so nice and we're just like, go back to sleep, sleep in, the weather's crappy anyway. <laughs> And, like, somehow my back was miraculously okay the next day. Um, I don't know. I normally don't have back problems. So it was kind of, like, one of those things, like, oh, my gosh, what's happening here? And then the other time, I don't know, we were just going up a lap up to the base of the fixed lines. And I just, I, I don't know if, I like, I hadn't slept well or if it was just really hot in the sun. But, I like, I just was not feeling it. I was, like, I don't know. Like, I... I need to go back to camp. I don't, I'm not like, there's no way I can go to the summit like this. And like Meredith was super supportive and came back to camp with me and made sure I rested in the tent and didn't bother me. <laughs> and, you know, like I was fine. And it, it just, you know, I think having a team that really supports you when you're having that low day was really um, critical to our climb and making it this great experience. All right, a couple more questions. Um, this is a good one. You kind of touched on this, but maybe not completely. So why do you leave your poop bag in a crevasse? Um, is that an issue that there's a lot of climbers up there? It will be as the climate continues to change and all of our old feces melt out of the glacier. But um, so you're gonna poop a lot because food and elevation and um, the historic thing to do at some point became that you take this, the bucket, I forget what the canister is called you guys, but um, that, that Carolyn pointed out in her description of the gear earlier and you put a decompostable bag in it and then you just use it like a toilet. It's in its own little um, snow bathroom and when it gets full or you're moving camps, uh, you walk to a designated hole that leads to a big glacier that the park has chosen and you drop it in. 
it feels like a it's a it's it's really gross it's like next level gross like you're looking at the composite of like all of the poop of everyone you're on the climb with you know what they it's bad it's bad but you walk to the edge and you go on belay because no one wants to fall into a poo crevasse like that is the only thing that is worse than an actual crevasse fall is a crevasse fall into a pit of shit but uh pardon my french but the idea is that it would be very difficult to take your feces all the way up the mountain and all the way down the mountain or if you left your feces in one place like a dog poop bag on a hike you might overlook it on the way down and then you'd have poop everywhere and then each year you know you're getting the composite of snow but then new new people arrive and they don't see what all was there last year and they're digging out snow for drinking water right you don't want that to be where you're gathering your drinking water so putting it in one place has historically been the best way to manage it that said i bet in the future there's an innovation that isn't that that was a really great explanation though thank you um all right two more it looks like um did you guys hire a weather forecaster um you don't you don't need to because um the park service at 14 um announces posts the weather every day so yeah so if you bring a, an frs radio um they announce the weather forecast each night and it's actually pretty funny to look at because you'll see all these people at whatever it is eight o'clock or whatever walking outside and holding up the radio high in the air so hopefully like <laughs> yeah just like meredith is doing <laughs> and, and they do trivia they have a trivia contest after they announce the weather so it's like this big fun thing to listen to the weather every night from the park service. and it's like it's like watching someone try to get cell service in like 1994 like it's but it's like 40 people doing it and then when one person gets it the whole group like shushes everyone else really aggressively it's like a life it's a it's a cultural experience so i guess i will answer the question a little bit differently for, than you two did though because um so in 2015 i think that was like the first year the garment in reach was really widely available and i remember kind of wishing that um like I guess in retrospect if I knew like how functional it was in terms of getting a forecast from someone from the outside like you don't have really good uh, radio reception um, in some locations going up the mountain so I think I would have spent the money to have that um, had I known it was available um, but like when you really need to know what the weather is you need to like the place you need to know what the weather forecast is is at 14 and you, you can always go read the signboard over at the ranger station. So that being said, it's kind of more of a luxury. Like, you know, it's like if you want to spend the money, great, but you don't really, really need it. And I would because, add, go ahead, Gar Carlin. Yeah, because you have you have the forecast. Um, I was, it's not like a reception issue. I was just going to add that if you're an all female group, you can also just flirt with a guide from the guide group and they just give you the forecast, which wasn't a thing that we did at all, ever. <laughs> but I understood it could happen. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, that's awesome. Um, okay. Couple more. It looks like um, how did the altitude affect your team, especially because this was higher than Rainier and maybe some of where you trained? The altitude just makes you cranky, and um, you don't want to eat the food that you have, even though it's delicious. And um, but we all took. I think all of us took Diamox, didn't we? I know I did. We took, we all took something, I think. Yeah. When I moved up to 17, for sure. I don't know that I used it very much lower down because you're, you're acclimating, the, the route lends itself to proper acclimatization. Yeah. I, was, I don't think I did it lower down either, but yeah, I think we all at some point took it. I will say I had two things that I really didn't expect. One was a complete and aggressive loss of appetite. I ended up losing 15 pounds in 26 days on Denali which is a lot, you come back looking not so good. Um, and I would just sit there and look at the food and I would just try and plow through it and I just couldn't rally. What I learned from that though that was useful was I had brought like a variety of foods 
including like my go-tos, which are like Triscuits with cheese and smoked salmon. And I brought like healthy candy, like organic candy that normally I would eat. Like if I can have, you know, sour worms on a road trip, I'll eat them all day and night. And I had no palate at all, no sweets at all. I was like, I don't even know why sweets exist. Why would I want sugar right now? And I just wanted, I could do the Triscuits and I could do the cheese. I couldn't do like anything grain-based. at night and I remember keeping others up and eventually at 14 camp a guy in the neighboring camp heard me coughing and uh and brought an inhaler over like an inhaler for someone with asthma and was like you should take this and I I think I actually like still have that inhaler not because I'm using it but it's like somewhere um but that cough really sucked and that cough plus a loss of hunger uh was I don't remember like feeling completely depleted, but I remember not feeling quite as perky and energetic as what I had trained for. And that cough ended up lasting, I think for a few weeks after I got back, like it was pretty hardcore. I'm gonna jump in and piggyback off of what Mer Meredith was saying a little bit, just because I had a slightly different experience. Um, I didn't really, the altitude in terms of hunger didn't really hit me until 17. Um, so I kind of ate like a champ. Um, but at the same time, I had picked up a little bit of a cold. And so I had a cold the whole trip. So that was always in the back of my head, like, oh my gosh, is it like, am I having a bad, you know, am I having a bad altitude reaction or am I more you know, am I more predisposed to altitude problems because I have a cold? So that was one thing that was kind of always in the back of my head because I had picked up that little bit of cold the whole on um, the whole trip. And I think when you start, when you go to altitude and you have any kind of cold or any little wound on your hand, it kind of just stays there until you go back to the land of milk and honey. <laughs> All right, um, what kind of games did you guys play? And I'll add to that a little bit about like, what else did you do in your downtime while you were waiting out storms? I, I think we played what's in my backpack at what point in time. <laughs> uh, I don't remember I mean, we any games. <laughs> We all had uh, Kindles. I read like three books. <laughs> uh, when we got stuck at 7,800 on the way out, like when we thought we were going to get out that day, and then instead it was three days later, you all did play like I Spy or What's in My Backpack, and you tried to get me to play, and I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, was, I was not in a, I was in a like very like, I will just sleep for three days kind of headspace. But for me, uh, I, I read, uh, I think it's Parting the Waters. It's this like 1,000 page Martin Luther King like biography. It's a great time to read a long book that you think would be really interesting if there were no other distractions. Great. I, I read it pretty encyclopedically. <laughs> All right, um, I'm gonna make this our last question because we're just about out of time. Um, this is a good one though. With the sleds, could you have had them in front of you while you were descending or are there any other ways for you to kind of place them while you're going down? I think, I think we tried to put them in front of us at one point, didn't we? <laughs> or we had no choice, they were in front of us at one point. I think, I think our, our most useful strategy was when we had the sled between us on the way down so that the person in back can kind of be the brake of the sled. Mm -hmm. I think that was the most successful strategy, if I remember correctly. I don't know, Meredith, do you remember? We, we tried everywhere you could put a sled, <laughs> and sleds suck. Um, but on the Thank way you. down, because we cached two sleds at, I think it was 11,000 feet, 
um, on the way down to, until 11,000 feet, we had just one sled between two people. And that definitely was relatively more manageable, but it does require a lot of coordination between those two people. Uh, and either way, the sled wants to slide and it wants to slide down on the person in front and it wants to pull down the person in back and it's, it's a thing. Oh, I remember one thing we did with the sleds. We, you can wrap this cordelette around them the to, to have like a self breaking thing to add more friction to the sled. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that, but yeah, we did that a little bit. Here the on sled break. Yeah, the sled brakes, I think, were pretty important. On the steeper part, coming down from 11,000 feet, I, I just, I remember seeing some people coming down and seeing some epically uh, twisting and sliding sleds that sometimes, like, detached themselves from their owner. Like, it was painful to watch. <laughs> That's, that's a good point, Carolyn. Better to have a break than no break, for sure. Like, I think that's actually a really good takeaway that I don't think I would have summarized that way, but that's, that is huge. Because if you have no break, then you're that owner being like, shit, there goes my stuff. And I, and I think the, the ideal situation is that you can just keep wrapping cord until you have the right amount of friction but the right amount of friction always is changing. And so like in an ideal world, it would be just enough friction so that you're barely pulling to pull the slide downhill, but it never quite works that way. <laughs> All right, well, we got one more question coming through, but this is going to be our final one. Um, how did you find the team members for your group and decide how many people to be on the team? I think guys touched on the creating your team at the very beginning of the presentation, but the number, that is interesting of how you chose the number. Do you want to go first, Meredith? Sure. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, we were very intentional. We, we really like, we like social science our team a little bit, and we like gap analysis our team a little bit. Um, I cornered Leanne at a Halloween party in like 2013 or 2014 that's how that part happened she's still my regular climbing partner um and then we knew what our strengths were um mine were logistics and planning uh and leanne's was brute strength and excellent navigation skills and we were like okay well we need to have people with complementary skills and so we did really intentional team making it wasn't like you know, hey bro, want to come climb Denali? It wasn't that at all. It was really intentional. Um, you know, we knew individually Jen and Carolyn from the Mountaineers, and Jen was very active with uh, Seattle Mountain Rescue and was super active in the Mountaineers teaching climbing at that time, and we just, you know, we admired her and her level of dedication to getting outside. Uh, and she seemed like, you know, Leanne and I are both very, we're like, we actually got mistaken for each other a few times on the mountain, we're, which I find very flattering. Um, but, you know, we're very tall, solidly built people. And, you know, we were like, we need some like fun, lighthearted energy and like upbeat and look at Jen. She's like giggling away on mute. But like, you know, so, so, you know, we invited Jen. And then we also knew Carolyn from the Mountaineers and she uh, had climbed a lot with my then partner, and um, I knew how excellent she was at climbing and that she had a high level of technical skill and that she also was very good at navigation because of stuff that we had been on out together. Uh, and so we really kind of like, we're like, okay, what, who are we and what do we need? And then we were like, and who are we and who do we want to do this climb with? Uh, and we really, we had heard from others that had more difficult experiences with their teams where they maybe didn't, uh, continue to understand each other over the duration of the climb. So we really set out to create a team in a way that actually really echoes how I've staffed up my nonprofit. Like it was very much like an organization uh, in that way. Uh, we even took like personality tests at one point, I think, in uh, West Seattle and sat around and talked about like how we handle stress and how we experience challenges. And the last thing I'll say about that, and then I'll give it over to the to my partners here, but is um, I'm in a really active conversation right now in Alaska about what female leadership looks like. 
Uh, and it really is different than male leadership in important ways. And I think sometimes we think about leadership that leads from like, are we compatible personality wise? Or, uh, you know, what are, what are the gaps that that person addresses for me? I feel like historically we treat that as like secondary or sort of weird or overly analytical uh, and like sort of lesser because it's not this like masculine like, hey bro, wanna climb a thing? But we had a 100% summit rate on our team and we busted ass and we're all still friends. And so I think that it's a really cool example of the way that female teams can climb together just the same way that female leadership manifests in different ways than male leadership. And that's not to say that one's bad, it's just to say that they're different and that's great and we should honor and respect it. Off my soapbox. Someone else say something. <laughs> well, I'll just, I, I, I love your soapbox, Meredith, that's awesome. <laughs> but um, I think I heard and or read somewhere that the number one reason that, that people don't summit Denali is because of team dynamics. It's not conditions, it's not your fitness level, it's because your team falls apart. Um, so that was something that Meredith was really good at, was assembling the right team and leading that team. So, yeah. All right, it looks like Carolyn's phone may have dropped the call, um, but that was still, those were really great answers on putting the team together. Um, and we are just about out of time. So a huge thank you to Carolyn for presenting and also to Meredith and Jen for chiming in all this Q&A. It's really great to have other people involved in that. So thank you everyone so much. And again, this was our last beta and bruise for the season, but we will be returning in either September or October, hopefully with in-person events again, but we'll see how that goes. So thank you all. Have a great night.